In this episode, we discuss a topic most people don't want to discuss, but is something a lot of women and couples struggle with, fertility. We are joined by the strong and amazing founder of Med Answers as she shares her powerful story. Welcome to the Abundant Talk Show, where we are inspiring you to tap into your power to manifest the happiness, success, and fulfillment that you desire. I am your host, Niaje, the Upper Limit Coach. I am here to dismantle your limiting beliefs and remove the blocks so you can confidently live your life's purpose, because life is meant to be abundant. Hey, m ms Thank you for tuning in to the Abundance Hack Show. What are you manifesting in your life today? I am really excited about today's episode. I am joined by Alice Creasy, and she is the founder of Med Answers. I know her to be the founder of Fertility Answers because she was actually a client of mine for some time, but I have been trying to get her on this show because she has such a powerful story, so I'm so glad she could be here. Alice, before I allow you to introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your story, I want to ask you, what does abundance mean to you? What a great opening question, Niage. <laughs> and thank you for having me on this show. I'm really excited to be here. You know, abundance is a word that I took on kind of in my 20s, which is 20 years ago now, which scarily enough was 20 years ago. And, you know, when I, when I first was thinking about abundance back then, it was all about money for me. Mm. And that really transitioned when I was diagnosed with cancer and lost everything and literally had to start rebuilding my life from the ground up, from the inside out, from the top down, you name it, I had to rebuild. And abundance took on a much different context then where it was having enough and it wasn't toppling over, it wasn't more than, it's that I had to come to terms with my life is enough, I am enough, there's enough time, there's enough money, there's enough health, there's enough wellness, I am enough. And all I am and all I'm not. Mm, so powerful. So powerful. So tell the audience your story. I know you have a really, and, and you mentioned a little bit of it, but it's, it's such a powerful story. So I like to, I like to allow people to, you know, introduce themselves and share their stories, your triumphs and everything that you've overcame. So yeah, share us, share sure. your story. <laughs> Well, I, yes, in, in my um, couple of decades as a grown up, I've, I've had a lot of life thrown at me, I think you could say. When I was 31, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I found a lump one day, just sitting on my couch, uh, kind of had an itch and was like, what's that? It was very high up on the chest. Honestly, I didn't even know if it was breast tissue because it was so high up on my chest mm -hmm. and was diagnosed 10 days later um, with breast cancer. And it paused my life. It, it, it literally paused everything. I was running a consulting company back then. I was loving life. I had a little house by the beach, my first mm. house that I had bought. I had a corporate apartment in New York. I was going back and forth between New York and a, a beach in LA, you know, every other week. I had a boyfriend, I had a couple dogs. I mean, mm. life was good, you know, life was really good. I just was on kind of that fast path to, you know, creating financial abundance. I was completely focused on that. It was mm -hmm. all about just what am I building, creating a legacy, build, build, build. And right when I was diagnosed, one thing that I was really certain of at the time in my life is that someday I definitely wanted to be a mom. Mm -hmm. Someday, not right then and there, not in four years, but I knew for certain that I wanted to be a mom one day. And I learned pretty early on in the process that that chance would most likely be taken away from me from the treatment that I was going to have to undergo. Mm. So I, I went ahead and preserved my fertility back then. At the time, egg freezing was still considered experimental. And mm. so they, the fertility doctor explained the statistics to me and said, well, if you only freeze your eggs, you have a two to 3% chance of them working. Mm. And I was, I'm not a gambler, but those odds were not the odds that I wanted to play. So she handed me a catalog of sperm donors and said, or you can freeze embryos. And I was like, okay. 
And I don't know if you've ever looked at a catalog of sperm donors, but you're looking like a bunch of statistics, like you're about to recruit a basketball team. You've got <laughs> height, weight, you have ethnicity, you have, you know, all these things that are supposed to help you decide if that's the right DNA for you. Wow. And so at first it was super, super overwhelming. We can get into how I went about that process later, but um, I did go ahead and actually pick a sperm donor because my boyfriend and I broke up. Mm. And so I, I got really lucky from the perspective of, I was able to, you know, make a selection and freeze embryos. And then five years later, I was able to do a frozen embryo transfer. And now I have a six-year-old. Mm. Wow. So, okay. So, okay. I, I actually didn't know that part of your story that you froze your, your embryo ahead of time. Wow. Oh my goodness. So even with the chemo that you went through, you still were able to go through the full term pregnancy your own, like without a surrogate. But, yeah. I, I felt really fortunate about that too, because there was at the time that I was even considering, am I allowed to get pregnant? Do I need to get a surrogate? Surrogacy is very expensive. It's in the U S it's about $120,000. Mm. There are great sur surrogacy programs outside the U S that cost less they're not always open to single women and I'm a single mom by choice. So there were all these different things going on at the time. Do I get a surrogate? Do I, um, do I carry myself? And when I went to my oncologist for that kind of all clear conversation, he cleared me to go ahead and carry the pregnancy myself. Mm. And I felt really, really happy about that. And I, would, I, I endured about three years of treatment. It wasn't just chemo. I was also kept in medical menopause. I was supposed to be in medical menopause for five years. And I basically begged my doctor to go off of it at year three because being 31 one day, at the, well, really 32 by the time it started, they, you know, it, they just shut off the lights. You're, you, you go in 32 and you kind of like come out after your first injection where they drain basically all your hormones and you come out like you're 62 oh and it goodness. caused so many side effects um, and crippling anxiety. Um, the hot flashes were absolutely insane because it's so severe. When women naturally transition, it truly is a transition. But when it's that severe, when you literally go from, hey, I'm 32 today hormonally to, nope, now I'm 62 hormonally or 52, you know, what have you, it was just so drastic. I had, I had bone pain, I had joint pain, I had um, you know, fluid retention, I had all these things. So I was super happy um, six months after being brought out of medical menopause when I got my period back. And I mean, that, I like called my dad, he was in a poker circle with a whole bunch of other adult men and he was <laughs> celebrating me getting my period back. <laughs> you know, you, I mean, you talk about triumphs. That was a triumph. Like my body was still doing what it was supposed to do for, you know, for somebody who at, at the time was 35 and I just felt so happy. And so then finding out that I could carry a pregnancy, I felt so happy about that too. Mm -hmm. And I started prepping for what's called a frozen embryo transfer. They of course don't transfer an actual embryo that's frozen, they thaw at first, um, but it is, it is the, the terminology for when you're going through that type of cycle through IVF. And I was so lucky because I had 14 embryos to work with. Mm. And so we thawed all 14, they were, they were frozen at day two. And so we grew them from day two um, to day five. And then um, from day five, I was able to biopsy the embryos and do genetic testing of them and found two that were totally normal chromosomally and really healthy. I transferred a boy and a girl and I have my boy, my Dante. Mm. Oh, oh my goodness. I have so many questions. So yeah. I, I, I could ask a million questions right now, but I, I do want to know at what stage did med answers and fertility answers come along in that process? Yeah. Well, I, th I think the idea probably was planted when I was going through cancer treatment because I had two oncologists who didn't agree on what my treatment plan should be. Mm. And for whatever reason, I had the foresight to get them on a conference call with me and, and discuss it, truly discuss it so I could hear both of their opinions and decide what really was going to be right for me. And once, once I did that, I ended up actually going with my second opinion oncologist instead. And it was, it was the right decision for me, um, one I do not regret. But I think it planted the seed for MedAnswers because I wanted to help people in their time of crisis 
have access to more than one opinion. And kind of simultaneous to that, I was already in the fertility space. I was running an onco fertility charity. I was helping people access reproductive services already. And then the advent of Facebook groups kind of exploded, you know, where all these niche groups emerged really with the intent that they would offer peer-to-peer -peer support, which is typically emotional support. Mm -hmm. But what ended up happening is that they started to be kind of a, a driver of the spread of misinformation. Mm. And so as I was looking kind of at all that and, and I met my business partner along the way, I, the idea just popped one day. And quite literally, my business partner and I, and he's a world-renowned reproductive geneticist, we, we sort of hashed the idea out over email. I was living in LA or actually I think I was living in Sacramento at the time. Um, he was living in New Jersey at the time and we both had other kind of business opportunities that we were, we were both involved in and we just hammered out the first idea over, over email. Um, but the initial concept for this app platform was really to connect people who are, are faced with a medical crisis or health crisis and connect them directly to a community of specialists so they could have clinically validated answers. You know, and, and that is what we launched in uh, 2017 in calling it Fertility Answers. The, I didn't want to call the company Fertility Answers because I want to replicate what we're doing in fertility and all these other domains. I want to do it for migraines. I want to do it for oncology. I want to do it for obesity and diabetes. And, you know, we're, we're doing fantastic. We have about a thousand users per week right now, um, but there's 180 million out there who need us. There's 180 million people who are struggling to have a healthy baby who need access to these specialists. Yeah. It's a super sensitive topic for me because I'm in my thirties. I am single. And so people have started asking me like, are you going to freeze your eggs? And so I try not to get emotional about the question, but I do also have a lot of friends that have suffered from miscarriages. And yeah. I just went to see Abraham Hicks. It's really funny. The first time I asked you about coming on the podcast, I saw Abraham Hicks and I just went to see her a second time. Oh, that's and amazing. Yeah. And there was a lady that got up and spoke about the fact that she has been trying to conceive and, and she had a miscarriage. And when I tell you, most of the women in the audience were like bawling. Yeah. So it's, it's something that a lot of people are suffering from. So I do want to spread the word about your service because it helps. But if anyone's listening and they have gone through a miscarriage or they are trying to conceive, what are some ways that they can start to prepare their body for a healthy pregnancy? I think that's such a great question to ask on the app. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we, I can, I can share what I did, you know, to kind of prepare, but, um, and I did go through, uh, four miscarriages before I did my frozen embryo transfer. And, um, cause I, I was in a relationship before I, I chose to be a single mom and I did have four um, pregnancy losses in that relationship. And then I've had actually one since having my son too. My, my body just, I, I produce eggs, they get fertilized. They just don't stick on their own without medication. And that, be, that became real obvious that I should just use the, uh, you know, the frozen embryos. I, you know, the, we have on the platform, we have nutritionists, we have clinicians, you know, we have reproductive endocrinology and, and, and fertility specialists. We have urologists. We have naturopath, who's the first naturopath in all of the field of fertility. Um, Dr. Raquel, she should be on your show. You would love her. She, and we have, um, you know, we have reproductive attorneys. We have um, embryologists, geneticists, genetic counselors. We have psychologists. I, you know, for me, even the, the, the conversations that you have with people on this podcast, it is whole bodied and, and the fertility journey and the fertility experience is whole bodied. Miscarriage is such a profound loss. The first time that it happened to me, the, the deep, deep depression that I was in, it was severe, you know, for a month. It was, I, you know, here I'd already gone through breast cancer and, and all of that. I already felt like my body failed me once. I already don't have, you know, any breasts. I have no milk ducts to even feed a child. And here, here it was, I can't even get pregnant and stay pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so the, so many emotions happen that if people are trying again, I really, really feel strongly that they have to fully process that grief. Mm -hmm. it's a, tr it is a trauma and it's a trauma that impacts your heart. It's the trauma that impacts your mind. It's a trauma that impacts your body. 
And that's, you know, one of the reasons that we brought on the naturopath onto the platform and, and truly she's the first one that we've ever seen that is, that is solely focused on fertility. You know, she really works well with people to get that, to get them physically ready. Um, but some of our psychologists too, that, that specialize in grief, that specialize in, you know, pregnancy loss and making sh that to me, that's the most important thing in gearing up for, um, for a transfer or for trying again naturally um, or unassisted. I don't like the word natural, um, unassisted. There's nothing unnatural about going through IVF. It's really just about medical assistance versus unassisted. Um, you know, and there are things people can do to prep their uterus nutritionally. Um, you know, we have a genetic kit that at least helps people kind of understand their, um, their uh, metabolism as it relates to micronutrients. Um, I tell people to eat a lot of omega threes, but again, I'm not the expert in what, how people should prepare their body. I can just talk about the things that, that we know from the platform and, you know, that I did. And it's like, eat a lot of omega threes, <laughs> eat the flax seed, eat the chia seeds, eat the, uh, the salmon, eat the sardines. Mm -hmm. I love, uh, throwing some sardines on a salad. Yeah. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about the kit. So I, I'm familiar with the kit, but for people who are, are not familiar with the kit, how would you sure. explain it? Yeah, well, you know, we we have a direct to consumer genetic kit. You know, there's everybody knows personal genetics these days. There there isn't a person I think on the planet who hasn't heard of 23andMe, mm -hmm. right? Um, and 23andMe does does a great job of covering some you know very broad kind of categories of diseases, but PCOS is the number one condition that leads to infertility, and it affects so many people in the world. And there are genetic markers for PCOS. And what we wanted to be able to do is in a very affordable fashion is, is bring some genetic insights to our users so they can look, you know, am I genetically predisposed to this condition that I have been diagnosed with, or is it really lifestyle driven? Because the confusing thing about PCOS is that in some cases, lifestyle choices can exacerbate it. And in some cases, you really and truly are born with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it is one of those things, you know, sort of similar to, to, um, to type two diabetes from the perspective of people have genetic predisposition to type two diabetes, but how, but certain lifestyle choices, certain dietary choices can accelerate the path to type two diabetes. Likewise, um, there are certain, um, you know, choices that people can make on, uh, if they do have PCOS that can mitigate those PCOS symptoms. Mm -hmm. Lots of women with PCOS do conceive unassisted, they do. And some people with PCOS cannot conceive unassisted. And so the genetic report is really designed to at least give them information so that they can have agency over their path to parenthood. And that might mean, wow, I've got kind of like the genetic card stacked against me, maybe I should go in to see a specialist. We cover the conditions that coexist with PCOS, like your risk for insulin resistance, mm. like your risk for cholesterol, high cholesterol, which also is um, correlated with, um, you know, risk of preeclampsia and risk of pregnancy loss. So, and then we, have, we of course, look at genetic weight as well, um, you know, because that can also be tied into PCOS is higher BMI. Then we, uh, we use the, the metabolism and um, we added some traits like about alcohol metabolism and caffeine metabolism. We do that really so that people can just understand their bodies better. Like, oh, I metabolize caffeine really quickly. That's why I only need half a cup to feel wired, you know, <laughs> versus, um, you know, the alternative where somebody needs like nine cups to feel like it did anything. So I, I think the report really is designed to give people agency, you know, over their body, um, and, and it's empowering. I think, I think the more knowledge that we know about ourselves, especially during a time where, where a lot of our users have been desperately trying to conceive for 17 months, 27 months, in some cases, like seven years, you know, with mm. no success. It's wow. just a really heartbreaking, it's a very heartbreaking area of life. Yeah. 
Are you ready to raise your vibrations and tap into abundance? Download our free abundance guided meditation to accelerate your manifestation. This will help you visualize your abundant life and align with that vision so it can become your reality. To download the MP3, go to abundancehack.com forward slash abundance guided meditation. And remember, life is meant to be abundant. Is there anything on the mental or emotional side that you would want to say to women that are in that space right now? Oh gosh. I know there's probably so much, but. (laughs) Yes, I know. So, well, it's more like, oh gosh, because I can like, I can feel, I can feel the experience, you know, it's, it's very easy for me to sort of call up the, the sadness and call up the struggle. You know, I can feel it in my chest. We have a, an incredibly empathetic team at the company. Um, you know, our users, each of them has a name and a unique story. I was just with a couple of them doing some video interviews a couple of weeks ago, and I couldn't get through the interview without crying. I, I, you know, I think the number one thing is, you know, they aren't alone. You're not mm-hmm. alone. You know, even where you are, Nayaje, like, you know, being in your 30s and, asking that question and whatever fear comes up around that of, you know, each of us has the right to live the life we imagined. And I, you know, we should do whatever it takes, takes to live that life, remove all barriers that are in the way, you know, and if there's something physical in the way, then let's get them in to see one of our specialists to remove that. If there's something emotional in the way, let's connect them to one of our amazing reproductive psychologists or social workers to remove what the emotional block that's in the way. You know, if there is gut health issues, let's get them in to see Dr. Raquel so she can fix that. If there are, um, you know, uh, anatomy issues, physiological issues, if there's, you know, an issue with with, uh, the swimmers on the sperm side, you know, everything can be dealt with but it does take courage. It does take courage to confront every one of these things. I think people have to fully feel their feelings and that's really difficult because there's so much grief in this process. There's so much shame. You know, I think us women, we just put so much shame on ourselves and that can impact a marriage and you need the marriage to be strong. If you know, and in some cases, unmarried couples that are trying to conceive too, because I think you know, there's a trend with the divorce rates being so out of control that people just want to live the life that they live and they don't necessarily feel like they have to go down the, the legal path of marriage. But the couple, the partnership, like if you're doing it on your own, making sure that you have your village, you know, it's, it, it is, it, it's tough to raise a kid. It's tough to, you know, go through egg freezing. It's tough to go through IVF to have a baby. It's tough to be pregnant. You know, none of this life is easy. And so, you know, asking for help and, and, raising the white flag like hey I need you people you know I think it's just really critical yeah I I I love 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 everything that you are creating and you also I know are LGTB friendly so yeah so that's another great thing I I knew a amazing couple that went through that whole process you know, trying to find sperm donors and she had a miscarriage once and having to go through everything all over again. So, you know, there is support out there for the LGTB community as well. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things too, even internationally, I'm sure you have some international listeners, um, is, you know, there, we still live in a world that all the laws are, are just skewed towards heterosexual married couples. Mm. You know, the laws are just so antiquated. And in some cases, uh, you know, the laws, even in other countries are, um, are terrible, you know, terrible and, and just filled with hate. So I think one of the benefits of, of us is that we can so quickly get people to the right place, you know, having reproductive attorneys on board as a, for instance, you know, the, this trend of unmarried um, people trying to conceive together. If they need IVF, the male partner will be considered a known sperm donor. Oh, wow. And there's exactly nobody, but nobody goes into it thinking that they're like, yeah, but we're together. That's going to be dad and I'm going to be mom. And, Mm -hmm. but that's not how the law works. That's not how the law is written. And so it, you know, um, if you need medical assistance, you know, to have, to have that baby, then, then the law comes into play. um, If it's not through sexual intercourse. 
And so when you're looking at the LGBT community, they can't have a baby through sexual intercourse, right? In the absence of sperm or in the absence of egg, then it has to be assisted. Even if it's an at-home insemination, it still has to be assisted, right? And so all these laws are just not written uh, to be supportive and they, we've got to play catch up. So some of the things that we're really passionate about at the company is, is just making sure that whether it's, um, whether it's a couple from Spain who it, it, gay men are not allowed to use a surrogate in Spain, Mm. you know, so surrogacy is illegal. So they have, we, we can set them up with, uh, you know, with places where it is legal, you know, for them to have their family the way that they need to have their family. Um, I feel very proud of that, that, you know, we have such a rich knowledge base, but also just a rich network of providers who can help everybody. Mm, I love it. And I, I found out recently through another guest that at home insemination is actually illegal in certain states. You have to go through a medical facility. I don't know which states in the US it is, but it is illegal in, in certain and states. And some of them it is. And, and it also, uh, you know, it's also, there, there's some risks associated with it. Now, you know, some, some people and some companies and some sperm banks are set up really well to kind of um, help with that. But a lot of at-home inseminations are happening very under the table, meaning they procure a sample from somebody that they know. They don't have proper legal paperwork and they, they you know, if somebody makes their deposit, that's what we call it when, you know, they ejaculate intentionally for a, a sperm deposit. Um, and, and then they old Turkey based your method, but there's also kits out there that they can, they can buy probably on Amazon, you know, to help them actually inseminate themselves just with, um, with, you know, a plastic type syringe, but those, you know, those are incredibly risky, but they do that because of the cost, you know, I mean, if you're somebody who, who needs to go down the path of assistance, it feels really wrong that you can't just do it the old fashioned way, right? And it feels really wrong that sort of the medical system doesn't care for us um, from the perspective of not care about us, but truly provide medical care for us when we need to access the, this, these types of medical procedures um, to have families. And that's, you know, part of that problem is with insurance access. And, you know, we do our part to advocate for insurance coverage. Um, you know, we stand with Resolve and all the unbelievable uh, advocacy work that they do every single day to help with insurance access. You know, we, um, we just feel really, you know, really strongly that, um, that insurance needs to be taking care of the whole person and not excluding something as important as family building. Mm, I love it. I love it. So, I know I, I can ask a million questions, but we have limited time. So before we wrap this up, what are your top three tips for living an abundant life? Mm. Such a great question, Niaje. <laughs> <laughs> my top three tips for living an abundant life. Oh my gosh. Um, let, can, I, can I throw a question back at you? Sure, sure. sure. What, what is it about my life that makes you feel like I'm living an abundant life? So I think that people see a lot of challenges and they just say like, oh, you know, I'll never have kids. I'll never have, you know, the life that I want. There's so many times where life has thrown some challenge at us that made us forget about suppress or just completely dump our desires. And I believe that we can live the life that we desire. If you want to be a mom, whether you're in a relationship or not, whether you've had some type of health issue or not, there are options out there. And mm -hmm. look, I'm going to try not to cry. <laughs> and I, I know, I know as a woman who wants a child, how that can affect you if you don't feel like you can have one. So I think that this is something that's really powerful that you're doing. And I, I love everything that, that you've created to support not just women, but, but people, because there, you know, there's the other end, there's men that, that want children, there's different situations and, and just providing that assistance, I think is really valuable. 
So, and right. I, and I know you work hard just from, from, you know, my time consulting with your, your company, I know you work hard and I know you're focused and driven. So I just, I really love what you're doing. And I, I would see the picture of you and your son and it just really, it really touched my heart. So oh, thank yeah. you. I think it's okay. So then that was really helpful. Thank you. I think that the three things that I would say is be courageous. Mm -hmm. I, I don't consider myself fearless. I've got tons of fears and I don't have any problem with that. I just stare fear down by taking action anyway. And you know, by being courageous, I think that it really takes courage to live the life you imagined and not let society or your parents or you know, old stories about yourself or your, your limiting self-beliefs get in the way. It's just courage, courage, courage every day. The second thing though is I, I would say being of service to other people, mm -hmm. you know, that truly, truly, uh, being service minded, you know, whether it, and it doesn't have to be grand gestures, right? It can be small, small acts of kindness, small gestures, but it's like a, it's like a way of being that if you stand for, I'm here to serve you rather than you're here to serve me. You know, it's not showing up to Starbucks and like, hey, what can I get today from that server? It's, can my smile brighten their day? Can my politeness, one thing that I, I uh, teach my son is every time we get out of a Lyft or an Uber or a taxi, well, we always have bags with us because we're always on the go and we're always traveling but I make sure to shake every person's hand and look them in the eye. Mm -hmm. I don't know what brought these, you know, drivers to, you know, to having, um, to having this job, but I know that they have to work really, really hard to have it be a profitable experience for them. And I'm sort of sitting in the back and it's like this weird thing in a way, right. Where it's like, you're being driven around and, you know, the people that used to be driven around are the ones that like make a lot of money. And I get that that's not true anymore, you know, but I wanted to teach my son that, no, like I, yes, he just did a service for us, but our service in return is like, is showing respect, treating every person with dignity. And I feel like that's a service minded, you know, culture that I'm trying to kind of raise my son up with. So those are like the first two things is courage and being of service because everything comes back a hundredfold when you're of service, right? You give a dollar, you get a hundred in return. It's just, um, it's just what happens. And I, I think that the third thing really has to be on, you know, you get, you do get what you focus on, you know, and, and that's why I say like, I, I feel that people just have to, you know, have the courage to confront whatever's in the way. And if, you know, if it takes journaling, if it takes writing an off affirmation every day, it, it's just, what are you focusing on? And, and I had, I'm not religious, but from time to time throughout my life, I've been a church goer, different types of churches, you know, I've kind of tried on everything. And, and I had this one experience with a pastor who said something I'll never forget. And it was, if you want to see what somebody values, just pay attention to what they've spent their money on and what they've spent their time on. Hmm. And I love that so much because it goes back to that focus. You get what you focus on is, well, where are you spending your money? Where are you spending your time? And, and if where you're spending your time, where you're spending your money is not going to reap any kind of, of feeling of abundance, whether it's abundance of love, you know, if you're working all the time and you're not allowing, you know, enough social time for people to love on you, if you're spending, you know, too much money on Amazon on Cyber Monday or Black Friday <laughs> or, or whenever, any day, right? Mm -hmm. You know, then then you don't see your kind of investments account, invest investment accounts, you know, grow or your passive income grow, um, you know, if and and so forth. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? So, I mean, I, I, those are my three: um, courage, being of service, and being mindful about you know where you're spending your time and your money. Yes. I love it. I love it. So what's next for you? Oh gosh. Um, personally, what's next is getting the company to a stable place with revenue so that I feel like I can do another embryo transfer because I want to have baby number two. Yay, that's so exciting. <laughs> it is exciting and also really scary being a, being a single mom of two. Mm. Um, but everything in my house comes in pairs. We have two kittens. We have two fish. We've got two hamsters. 
my son's been saying that we need another dog so that we have two dogs. Um, <laughs> so we'll have two kids and, uh, and I am working on manifesting a life partner. So if you know anybody you want to set me up with, I'm <laughs> where, where are you located? In LA. Okay. Yeah. I know a lot of people, so I'll see. I'll see. Yeah. Yep. So Dante's been great about that. My son's a little manifester. And so we, we talk about, you know, who, who we're looking for in a, in a, in a dad, you know, he kind of calls it our dad, you know? Oh my God. And I love it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I that's love it. Next. We're just get, getting the company to a, a scalable place. Um, so that I feel like I won't be the stressed out pregnant lady. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I'll go ahead and put the links in the show notes, but if someone's listening, do you want to share the links sure. for the website? Yeah. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, I think the easiest thing is for someone to just download the Fertility Answers app on iOS or Android. Um, we do, I think it's important to note that we ask you to fill out a health profile because we use that information to match people to the solutions that they need. Um, that's something that, you know, we feel like is super innovative and, and we're just rolling it out now. Um, that could even include clinical trials. So we, we have clinical trial partners. Um, that, that way we can make sure that we get everybody to the right place that they need. We can match them to a clinician. We can match them to the right type of ovulation kit. We have an at-home sperm kit we can match them to if they need that. Um, but I think the easiest way is just to download the app right from the iOS store. Um, it's called Fertility Answers on both Google Play and the App Store. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you <laughs> I'm so glad much. we finally had an opportunity to sit down and chat. So I, I think that people are going to find a lot of value in this and definitely go download the app because, you know, there, there is options and what they're doing is absolutely amazing. So thank you for your service <laughs> and good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for coming. All right, M&Ms, until next time, love and light. Thank you for tuning in to the Abundant Tax Show. I would love to hear from you. Leave your comments and questions, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our yummy episodes. Every time you leave a five-star rating or review, I do my happy dance. <laughs>